And uh, we're going to read a real tough situation. We've read it before, but we're going to a whole different thing. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse number 3 is where we're going to start. Now, this is the scene, of course, where David uh, uh, saw Bathsheba and, and so forth. And verse number 3, and David sent and inquired after the woman. One said, is not this Bathsheba? And what I want you to key in on right now is the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. I'm going to preach a message today on Uriah the Hittite. Okay, and uh, I want you to jump down to verse number six after David had sent for her and so forth. You know, she had been upon a rooftop bathing. He saw her, inquired about her, sent for her, uh, so forth and all that. And then verse number six, David, uh, and, and she sent word to David that she had conceived a child. And so David begins to try to cover his sin. And he said, verse number six, and David sent to Joab saying, Joab's the general of the army. There, The army is out in battle. In war, he said, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. Of course, you know that's all just a bunch of nonsense. He's not, that's, not, that's not the subject at all. This is a total pile of deception. Verse number 8, David said to Uriah, go down to thy house, wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, went not down to his house. And when they told, had told David, saying, Uriah went not unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, How many believes right now that God is behind the scenes? God's orchestrating things. It just wouldn't really be normal for a guy not, not to have went down to his house, but uh, there's a, there's something going on here deeper even than just the surface deal, and we'll get to it. Um, verse 11, Uriah said unto David, the ark, underline that right there. Now, this is Uriah's answer to David when he asked him, why did you not go down to your house? This isn't just accidental. This is something else right here. He said, the ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields, Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. I want you to just kind of remember that, because there's just a little side deal we're going to do on that. He made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning... That David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. It came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of his servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, if so be that the king wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh in the city when you did fight? Know ye not that, that they would shoot from the wall? Who, this is what he's supposed to answer. Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerob Shebeth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then thou saith, this is his only answer when that came up the question. The only answer was, thy servant Uriah the Hittite, now we're preaching on him, is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Job sent him for. The messenger said unto David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us in the field. We were upon them unto the entering of the gate. The shooters shot from off the wall upon the servants and some of the king's servants be dead. And the servant Uriah, thy servant Uriah. And that's interesting. He said, thy servant. The Hittite is dead also. And then David said unto the messenger, Thou shalt say unto the Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against city, overthrow it, and encourage thou him. And when the, watch it, verse 26. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Turn your Bible now to chapter 13. And we preached last week or two on some of this. Chapter 13 is the story where, where uh, Amnon, 
rapes his half-sister Tamar, and um, then Absalom uh, murders Amnon two years after that. And we looked a lot of that last week. In chapter 13, we have this sordid story, of again, of Amnon's rape of his half-sister Tamar. And then verses 23 through 39, you have that real sad account where Absalom's hatred and his eventual murder of Amnon, his half-brother. Now, the Bible said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, it goes without saying, it's been preached and taught and told many times, that we reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow. This is called the law of sowing and reaping. We reap what we sow, more than we sow, and we leap, reap later than we sow. There is an amazing connection between chapter 11 and chapter 13, of accuracy and detail as to the truth of Galatians 6 about this law of sowing and reaping. What David sowed in chapter 11, he reaped in detail in chapter 13, and I'm just going to go through this real quickly, and then we'll get into the main of the message. There's, It's not strange, it's strange in the sight of humanity, but I want to show you the power of the Word of God. That if, if you're here and you're skeptical about the Bible, you're listening, you're skeptical about the Bible, let me tell you, just what I'm getting ready to tell you is just one among thousands of things that lets you know this is the divine word of God. In chapter 11, uh, the primary source of Uriah's murder was the committing of of immorality. Okay, The primary reason for his murder went all the way back to an act of, of, of immorality. Amnon's death, the primary cause of his death was what? It was immorality. That's, number, that's the first correlation. Chapter 11, the cause of death was immorality. Chapter 13, the cause of death was immorality. Secondly, in both cases, there was an invitation to a feast. David had Uriah to come down and set a mess of food before him, feeding a big feast. In Amnon's case, Absalom had the sheep shearing time, big feast, invited everybody down. So you got the cause is the same. Both of them has a feast. Thirdly, deception was used to get both of them to where they could be killed. Both of them. Deception had to be used to get them to the place where they were murdered, if you'll check it out. Fourthly, liquor was involved in both cases. Uriah, David made him drunk, gave him liquor. Amnon, whenever they get ready to kill him, you know what Absalom said? When his heart is merry with wine, kill him. These are not just accidental things. I mean, you can just bark right down the tree on this thing, and you see an absolute David reaps two chapters later in detail, down to the detail of the things he did. How many figured out you've lived long enough that you reap exactly what you sow? But a lot more. I mean, it will come. The fifth thing is that the physical, the actual physical murder was not done by the person doing the, that was perpetrated the murder. Both of them had somebody else to do the actual killing for them. And uh, the sixth thing was, that there was a mourning after both Bathsheba mourned after her husband Uriah's death and David mourned after Amnon's death. And I mean, it just, you know, and there's probably several other things in there, but I mean, you just goes right down the tree. I mean, everything that happened in chapter 11 that David did, he reaped it in chapter 13 down to the detail of the food and the liquor and the invitation and the whole nine yards. If that don't teach you something in life is that we're going to reap what we sow. Sometimes we may not remember but God does remember, okay? Now I'm going to preach on Uriah, a reflection of his life. There is a sobering reality and truth about being a believer, a Christian, a follower, Terry. And I couldn't, I'm telling you right now, if you were here for Bible class, you're going to see this message go so well with what he did in, in Bible class. There is a real, and, and whenever Brother Blair said back there, he got saved and you know, you kind of have this idea that life's at least going to be nice and good and, and, and you don't, you don't realize at that point in time that you're probably going to lose most of your best friends. You're going to lose some of your family. A lot of rough stuff's going to happen to you and it's not going to be a bed of roses or picnic. And the more consecrated and the more of a disciple of Jesus Christ you are, the worse it's going to get. That is a sobering reality. And I, I just don't think it's a, I was talking to brother, uh, shoemaker. I don't like being involved in making false converts. And, and I'm not out to tell, I don't think you necessarily need to tell a baby here in this room, dread life, it's going to be terrible, kids. But the truth about it is kids need to be prepared and trained and equipped to face the hardships of life. The same way when we lead people to Jesus Christ, we need to be honest with them and say you need to count the cost. Probably going to lose a lot of friends. If you really, if you really come out for Christ, you're going to lose some friends, may lose your family, it may get rough. And further than that, you're probably going to get done dirty as a dog. 
I would want to say that if the truth came out in this congregation today, that nearly every person in here has been saved for some length of time, in some way or sort, some manner, you have been absolutely dirty dogs. You could not believe what happened in your life. And this is that truth that, it, that often that we don't really like to think about or realize. Life is not fair. It's not. Uh, it often will seem that it does not pay to serve God. That's just the flat truth about it. In this world, it just, tell, you tell me. It just lopped up, doesn't seem to pay to serve God. The devil will tell you there's no benefit for doing right. That evil triumphs over good. You look around you day by day and you look and you say, well, they don't, they don't, they don't do anything. I mean, they could care less about God and they're not even, you know, and look, they just get along fine. Everything's rosy. It looks like sinners get by with it. And then it looks like the more you surrender to, uh, to the will of God and obey the will of God, the worse things get. As I said, then you get done dirty and you get betrayed and rejected and all that kind of stuff. And then you get, like it says in the Psalms, you start crying out, Lord, how long shall the wicked triumph? You know, you know, Lord, how long is this going to go on? Are you ever going to set things right? And then if we're not careful, we're really asking the question, God, if you're up there, why would you let this happen? Why does life have to be so mean? Why does it just go on? Somebody says, well, life, life goes on. Yeah, it goes on with its grief and its sorrow and its pain and its misery and its disappointments. Yeah, it goes on. And sometimes we wonder, Lord, why? And uh, back a long time ago, probably 25 years ago, I was preaching out uh, in Carolina, it's actually, Brother Simpson Church up to the conference, and a 22, about, boy about 22 years old got up. He's a young preacher, boy, pastoring. And he got up and he preached on Uriah. First time in my life I'd ever heard anybody preach specifically on Uriah. And he preached on the fact that Uriah went up there and he preached on where did everybody go to. And he preached on, they set Uriah up there, then all the other soldiers were told to back away and get away from him so he'd be killed. And he used that an illustration of serving the Lord. He said, you know, you come to Wednesday night prayer meeting and where's everybody at? <laughs> where did everybody go to? You know, you, you're going to go soul winning. Where'd everybody go to? You know, he's trying to serve the Lord. Where, where'd everybody go to? And it was a great message. And boy, that old boy, he's old country boy. And I love that. Message. Never did forget it. That's the only message in my life. 35 years of preaching, 64 years of living that I ever heard on Uriah. And this week, God gave me a message on Uriah the Hittite. And, um, here's the first thing I want to say about him. Uriah the Hittite usually is just kind of a fading side note to King David's life experiences. You go through there, you hear about him. He, uh, he, he, he was out in battle. He was out being in war and King stole his wife, committed his wife, had him killed. And you just kind of go on with David's life. And he's just kind of a, seemed like a side note. And he's like a nobody. He's almost, you know, it's just, it's kind of weird. You know, he, he, uh, he's done dirty. He's killed. And the Bible goes on. And that's the truth about a lot of, you know, did you know that 99.99.99% of people are not King David? There's a lot more Uriahs in the world than there are King Davids. The truth about it is this morning, your life's far more apt to be like Uriah's than it is King David's. And I don't, it's like the Lord said, hey, Reggie, you know, I know you're preaching on the life of David, but Uriah is vitally connected to that life message. And you're missing something here. And, and boy, I'm telling you, I, I'm having a hard time right now preaching. I, I hope you'll pray for me. Lord, help me to preach this morning. I can't preach without you, Lord. And I don't even want to try. I'm so dependent upon you. Lord, I'm worthless. I'm wicked. I don't even know why you're, but Lord, you call me to preach. And I want to be faithful to that. And I need your help preaching this morning, Lord. This kind of stuff, Lord, is not some college class. It's not some talk show. It's your word. And God, this truth that's in the word today about your eye, we need it really, really bad. And I pray somehow, another Lord, by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you'd help me to convey these truths. So that, Lord, the Holy Spirit is preaching on the inside of these folks' hearts and minds while I'm preaching from the outward. God, please do that for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So David does what he did, and he has Uriah killed, and life goes on. And it's just like he's just kind of a discarded side note in the Bible. But I don't think that's true anymore. I've changed my whole world. I've changed my whole attitude about something. If it were possible, I would interview Uriah the Hittite this morning. I wish we could have him sitting right up here and ask him some questions. I really do. Because I'll be honest with you tonight, you're, you would relate to Uriah in some ways way more than you could ever relate to David. I'd ask him to reflect on his life, and um, but I can't. But I can examine the scripture, and I know that if I study his life in the scripture, in the big picture of eternity, the Bible said it's profitable for me, and it's already been profitable for me. It's really helped me. The Bible says that. So let's see if we can get an after it's all over picture of Uriah this morning, his life and his death.
The first thing I want to say this morning is a question. How did Uriah live? How did Uriah live? There's a one-word answer to that, and it's called faithful. This is one of the most faithful men you're ever going to read about in the Bible. But you never hear that. It's like, ah, oh, Uriah was a soldier, had a good-looking wife, David stole her, had him killed, everybody went on. That's not so. This man is one of the most faithful men you'll ever read about in the Bible. Let me tell you, number one, listen to me. He is faithful to his spouse. He is faithful to his wife. You know, I want to tell you tonight, you may never preach. You may never be a missionary. You may never teach a Bible class. You may never sing a special. But if you're married and you're faithful to your spouse, as far as I'm concerned, you're a great person. If America just had people that's faithful to their spouse, we'd be a different country. We're just faithful to our spouse. Hey, best I can tell you, better man, David. Yeah. I want to tell you this is one of the greatest men in the Bible. One of the greatest men in the Bible. He is faithful to his spouse. Watch this, even though she was not faithful to him. He said, wait a minute, I don't think Bathsheba. No, I'm going to tell you something. I blame it all on David, but she has responsibility. She had no business being out on a rooftop bathing. Second of all, I really believe with all my heart she could have said no. I really believe that. And he said, well, I, I don't know. I wasn't there and you weren't there, but I just don't buy into this whole deal that she has no responsibility in it. You know what I say? She could have said no. She could have said, I ain't going, and that ain't happening. And I believe she had a David who backed off. I'm going to tell you something right now. The Bible does not record that she sent message to her husband. I just been, I just been misused by the king. You know what she did? She started communicating with David stuff that she wasn't even telling her husband. She didn't go tell her husband, I'm a child by another man while you're gone, honey. Did she? No, she sent message to King David and said, I'm a child. That tells me something. What I'm telling you right now is, listen to me. There are people all over this country, I deal with them week in, week out, who've been done dirty by their spouse. If you want to learn something from your ride this morning, just be faithful to God anyway. You know, it did say until death do us part. You see, God's not asking you to be some big, famous, somebody re- religious person, not some big Christian somewhere. You know what? We just need some Uriahs in our churches that are just faithful to their spouse, even if their spouse is not faithful to them. And I want to say that I have a heart for people who've been done dirty. I don't think there's anything any dirtier and low down and sorry and wicked than being unfaithful to your spouse. There's not a copperhead snake in Douglas County that crawls any lower than that. And I know we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's just still the truth. He's faithful. How did he live? He lived faithful. He's faithful to his spouse. Secondly, he's faithful to his king. David said, I want you to send your eye down. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Come down there. What do you need? You never read of any place where he was unfaithful to David. I'll tell you how faithful he was to his king. He carried his own death sentence from him. That's pretty faithful. Even when the king wasn't faithful to him. Are you listening to me? I'm going to give you a pattern. I'll show you something here. He was faithful to his wife when she wasn't faithful to him. He was faithful to his king when he wasn't faithful to him. And thirdly, he was faithful to his commander, Joab. Joab said, do this. Faithful. Joab said, do that. Faithful. Joab said, Go up there to that, you go up there to the hottest part of that battle. Faithful. And Joab was not faithful to him. Joab's sorry scoundrel, as far as I'm concerned. He was his leader. He was his commander. You know what he should have said? I'm not having no part of this business of murdering one of my faithful soldiers. First Samuel, second Samuel 23 tells you that, he, that you ride the Hittite was one of David's mighty men, his 37th mighty men. He's one of the greatest men that man had. But I want to tell you about this man, Uriah. It's like all of a sudden he had just been kind of a discarded side note and it grieves my heart that I'm so, you know, I followed the religious deal. You know, it's all about David, 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 David. And yes, David's a great man, but I want to tell you something. This man, you write somebody else. He was faithful to his wife. He was faithful to his king. He was faithful to his commander. But I want to tell you who he's really faithful to. What made him faithful to his wife, what made him faithful to his king. And this is what will make you and I faithful to our wives, our spouses. It will make us faithful to those that we're serving. It will make us faithful in the areas where to be faithful. He was faithful to God, fourthly. He was faithful to God. In verse 11, it says, when David asked him, in verse number 11 of chapter 11, David asked him, said, why didn't this now not go down to thine house? He said, why didn't you go down and sleep with your wife? I want you to look at the very first words out of his mouth. Uriah said to David, the ark, the ark. He gave it right in order. He said, I got to be faithful to God. You know what he was saying? I'm not out there fighting these wars for you. I'm not out there fighting these wars. I'm fighting for God. And I've got to be faithful to God. Above everything else, I have to be faithful to God. Let me tell you something. God, but here's the question I want to ask you now. 
He was faithful to God, which enabled him to be faithful to his spouse, which enabled him to be faithful to his, whatever it, his employer or his boss or whoever it may be. But I want to ask you a question, and I'm not even going to answer. I just want you to think about it. Was God faithful to Uriah? Just think about it. Uriah was faithful, but was God faithful to Uriah? He let his wife be stole. He let him be done dirty like that. He let him be killed, murdered under a just horrible, filthy, nasty, low down, deceiving lie. His life cut off. He didn't get to hold some baby boy. He didn't get to bring those twins into church. He didn't get to do all those things that a husband would like to have done with his family. He's cut off as a young man and killed. And God let that happen. And the man was faithful. I'm preaching to you this morning. Some of you, you're trying to be faithful. Things ain't going good. Things ain't turning out like you thought they might. And you've been done dirty dog dirty by the very people that were the closest to you who ought to have been your friends, who have ought to have stood with you and helped you. I mean, you'd like to think if my spouse stays with me, I can handle the rest of it. Right? That's the honest truth. By the way, that's a good thing to remember. You and your spouse stick it out and stay together. You can handle most anything that's coming down the pike. So what did David live like? He was faithful, but here's the second thing I learned from you, right? What did he look like? He looked like a fool. And it's what you're going to look like if you're faithful to God. And that's what we don't like. This man was faithful, and when a man's faithful, it's going to make him look like a fool to other people. He looked like a dupe. Do you want to be honest? Do you know why people kind of bypass Uriah and why they just kind of sweep him past? Him? He's just a side note because he looks like a dummy. He's out fighting war. He's out being faithful. Somebody's sleeping in bed with his wife. He's coming up saluting the commander and he's carrying his own death sentence back. The guy's not too street wise, is he? He not. He don't know what's going on. I mean, can't the guy see everybody? Everybody around him knows he's stupid. Hey, idiot! Your wife's being stole from you. You're being sentenced to death. You ain't got no sense. You're kind of, you're kind of a dummy. And when God's people, when God's people are faithful to God and there's a lot of junk going on around them and they don't even know what's going on, but they're just faithful. It makes them look like a fool and you're going to look like a fool. You're going to get done dirty. You're going to get done rotten. You're going to get, but just be faithful. But remember in your faithfulness that the world's going to, the world's, the perspective of you is that you are a fool. They said, I can just imagine the thoughts that went through those people's mind. There's little obeying. There's little nice obeying Uriah, little fool. There's little obedient, uh, uh, you're right, ignorant, naive, doesn't know what's going on, not very street smart, not much discernment. Don't you know what's going on behind the scenes? Or he's, he's just got too many Bible convictions. Or he's a fanatic. Or he's missing out on all the fun by his faithfulness. Or he's missing out on life. He's too consecrated. That's your discipleship. He's too dedicated. That's your discipleship. Come on, back off, man. God's not asking you to miss out on all the fun of life. And you know what happens to you and I? Well, I can see him saying he's a fundamentalist. He's too strict. He takes the Bible too literally. And here's what happens to a dedicated, consecrated, sold out to the truth child of God that's obedient to the word of God. To the world's eyes, you and I look like fools. If we don't chase the world's butterflies, we're fools. If we don't carry the favor and curry the favor of blessing and of the world, we're fools. If we set our affections on things above, we're fools. If we live in the light of eternity, we're fools. If we desire to obey God's commands and just try to live out his basic, the issues of life, marriage and modesty and home and children and what we watch and what we do and trying to please God with it, we're considered to be fools. I'll be honest with you, I don't want to go to a NASCAR race and sit on the back of a pickup truck bed drinking a Bud Light. And I'm I, I just not interested in that. I, I, God gave me a different life. And I'm not interested in that junk. But if we don't do those things, it seems like we're considered to be the fools. If we come out of the religious world and out of the camp of the organized religion, it seems like we're made out to be fools. And if we don't let the world educate our children, it looks like we're fools. We're made out to be fanatics. We're missing out. If there's some places we won't go or some movies we won't watch or some music we won't listen to, then we're considered to be fanatics. And, oh, you know that bunch over at Liberty Faith. If we lose people out of church or other people never come because we won't compromise or go along with the latest religious fads, then we're considered to be fools. 
I'm considered to be a fool because I won't abandon the King James Bible. Oh, Reggie, don't you understand? A lot of people would come, but you're so adamant on the King James Bible. Oh, Reggie, don't you realize? I mean, I've had people tell me, you know, I, I, I always kind of want to go up there, but you're too strict. You know, and so they, you know, you're made out to be some kind of idiot. You're, you're, you know, some guy, oh, you know, I guess he's a nice guy, but he's a little fanatical. And it's all because of what? You're just being faithful to the word of God. I'm telling you, there is a there is a message in Uriah's life that if you're going to be faithful to God, you are going to be made out to be a fool in this world's eyes. When you lose financial opportunity because you wouldn't compromise your biblical convictions, you look like a fool. Oh, man, alive. You ought to take that job. Yeah, but it would keep me out of church on Sunday. Fool. When your spouse forsakes you and yet you remain faithful to God. Hey, man, you better start looking for another woman. Don't you get it? That's over. When you've been done the dirtiest by those who are the closest, as Uriah was, and you still serve God, and you still say, I'm, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm going to church Sunday. I'm going to worship God. What are you going to do? I'm still going to read my Bible. Still going to pray. Still going to sing. This is what Uriah's life looked like from a human, earthly, worldly perspective, like a foolish waste. And like I say, when you've been done the dirtiest by the closest, and you're just faithful to God, And here's the wild part about it is, there's usually stuff you don't know and will not know and you will die not knowing. But I want to tell you this morning this, and I want you to get a hold of this. And I'm purposely being methodical while I'm preaching because I, let me tell you how he would have really been a fool. If he went down to his house, spent a couple of nights with his wife, had a baby born about somewhere around nine months later and lived all his life thinking it was his child, then he would have been a fool. If he went down to his house and believed that his wife was lovingly faithful to him while he was gone, when all the time she wasn't, then he would have been a fool. If he went on down his life having believed that David and Joab were his loyal friends, then he would have been a fool. Let me tell you about Uriah. He ain't nobody's fool. I'm going to tell you why he's not. Not because he didn't know everything going on was that because it didn't matter about what's going on in my world, I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm going to be faithful to God, even if I don't know or understand everything that's happening. And here's the real deal. If you and I can get to where we are faithful in spite of what's being done, and we focus on being faithful rather than vengeance and hurt and pain of what's been done to us, You see, what Satan wants to do is get our mind off of being faithful and distract us from being faithful and being worried about all that's happened to us and all that's been done to us. But the message of your eye is it doesn't really matter what's happened to you. Be faithful. The answer to being done dirty is be faithful. Just don't even change. Be what God called you to be. Do what God called you to do. And let God take care of all the dirty garbage going on around you and to you. It would have been better, it would be better for a person to die faithful than to live as a fool. You see, he died faithful rather than living like a fool. When you've served the Lord and when you've been faithful to his word, when you've trusted him and it all goes bad, the world will say, what did Satan tell Job? What did Job's wife tell Job? Curse God and die! Quit being faithful! It doesn't pay! God doesn't care. Don't you see that idiot? Forsake the Lord. Curse God and die. Throw it away. Throw your life away. You've been done dirty by God and everybody else. Throw it away. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. The world will call you a fool for trusting God when everything's going bad. I, I want to say to the young people of this church, do what's right. Live for the Lord. Wait for God's mate. Be modest, be moral, and guess what? You're going to be looked at as a fool by this world. But you be faithful. So how did, number one, how did Uriah live? He lived faithful. How did he look? Like a fool. But what did he leave us? Facts. And this, I love this. Now, I'm an emotional kind of person. You know that. I can get whoopy doo and, you know, get all excited. But you know that that does not carry me through the storms of life. Facts and truth of Scripture is what carries a person through. So I want to look at now, the most important part of this message is what did Uriah leave us? He left us some facts. He left us a testimony. And the first thing I want to say to you, he left us a a testimony of God's grace. Uriah the who? 
Hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 17, God told the children of Israel, he said, there's Hittites in that land you're going to go into. And when you go in there, you kill them all. They're pagan, heathen, rotten to the core, kill them all. Well, Israel didn't do what God said to do, evidently, because here's a Uriah the Hittite. You know what it tells you? You study his life. What did he say? The ark. What did that tell you about him? Did you know that Uriah the Hittite was a convert? He had been converted from a pagan heathen. Either he or his father or his grandfather, somebody down the line, had converted from their paganism and their heathenism to the God of Israel, to the God of the Bible. Because when he was asked, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? He said, the ark. The ark was where God resided. He said, I'm living for God. That's the purpose of my life. And the things that I do or I don't do is because of the ark. Okay, so he's a convert. Now, you say, How, what in the world went on here? It is a testimony of the grace of God. This is big. Why is it that a man like Uriah, who had, he, you see, here's was his deal. He had been condemned to death by God Almighty, according to Scripture. Deuteronomy 20, 17. Worthy of death, condemned to death. But you know what he found? Can anybody tell me? He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you know what, Uriah the Hittite, one of the reasons that this man is one of the most faithful men in the Bible is because he never forgot where he could, should have been, and he never forgot where God took him from. And God saved him and saved him by his grace, and now he's going to heaven and not to hell as a lost Hittite. He's now going to heaven as a saved, converted Hittite that God by his grace and God by his mercy saved him. And that is the key to being faithful, is if you can remember where you should have been and would have been had it not been for the grace of God. You see, his focus, watch it. Watch this. His focus was not on how dirty everybody's doing me. His focus was on the fact that I'd have been in hell if it hadn't been for, Je- for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd have been in hell had it not been for the grace and the mercy of God. This is what Satan wants to do to you. He wants somebody, he gets somebody to do you dirty, low down life, dished out a bunch of junk to you. I mean, everything went south, went sorry. And he wants you to focus on that instead of focusing that, you know what? If you lose everything else, if you lose everything and everybody and still go to heaven, it's okay. It's all right. You lose your farm, you lose your house, you lose everything, you lose your friends, but you're saved. It's okay. It's okay. Those you love and cherish, treat you like dirt, betray you, forsake you, throw you out in the world's trash pile, and yet you've received God's mercy and you said, you know what, that's a bad deal and I hate it, but that's not the main thing in my life. The main thing in my life is that I found the grace of God and God saved me and I'm going to heaven when I die. And, and you know what, all, now all the dirty dirt, the dirt bag stuff has been done to you, all that makes him want to do is get there faster. So if the world makes you out as a fool, but you die faithful, it's okay. That's what he's teaching you. It's not about how dirty everybody's doing you. It's not about what life dished out to you. It's not even about how bad you failed. It's not about that. It is about the fact that the mercy and the grace of God saved you, and you're going to heaven in the end of this thing. That's what counts. If I lose everybody and everything, but I don't lose my soul, I'm okay. I'd rather have Jesus. Listen, in the eyes and in the view and the perspective of the world, Jesus died a foolish death and lived a foolish life. Last time I checked, he never got married and had a family. Last time I checked, he never was a wealthy man. Last time I checked, he was forsaken, rejected, and betrayed by everybody and his brother before it got done with, Terry. Last time I checked, he had no house, no home, no land, no assets. He left anybody. You know what he left? was the cross and the empty tomb. But in the eyes and the view of God and eternity and to the saved, there's no life or death that ever existed on the face of the earth that's more, that mattered more than Jesus' life. So you see right now, someone, it doesn't matter about the hatred that he experienced, and it doesn't matter how Jesus was done dirty, and it wasn't, doesn't matter about his forsaking, because it was in all those things, what matters was that he accomplished what his father sent him to do, and he suffered and died and rose from the dead for our sins and provided salvation for you and I, and that's what matters. It doesn't matter about all what, how everybody's done you dirty. Can you see, can you say, yourself, that if I lose everyone and everything, and if this life and this world does me dirty, but I'm saved, it's okay. It's enough. There's people out here this morning that, I mean, there's people out here born with no arms and no legs, and there's people out here that's had horrific wrecks, and they can't walk, and there's people out here that don't have eyes and can't see, and there's all kinds of tragedies, and, and there's babies that's been molested. I mean, every day now in the news, it's just constant. Some child has been molested and raped, and, and people are killed and slaughtered, and what did they do? I mean, people are being done dirty by the millions while I'm preaching is while people's being done dirty. Life is dished out horrible, horrible, horrible things to them. 
some parent picks up the phone and it's some police officer and say, you need to come down here. There's been a wreck. What'd we do? Where'd we go wrong? Well, you need to come down here. This has happened. That's happened. He left a testimony of grace that if everything goes south, all that matters, I'll make it to heaven through Jesus Christ. Number two, he left a testimony concerning grief. And this is powerful. Yes, it was awful what was done to Uriah. It was horrible. It was sick and it was perverted. I'll tell you, that's the lowest down, that's the lowest down stinking story you nearly ever read. A guy who's supposed to, he's one of David's mighty men, supposed to be one of his close associates, steals his wife, you know, has him killed, then marries her, and goes on down the road. I mean, how much lower low down does that get? If he'd been a total stranger to him, you know, he could be like, but a friend? And another thing, Uriah died early. We might say he died too young. He died without cause, no reason. Uriah was cheated out of many of the joys of life he might have experienced. But I want to tell you something Uriah can testify to you and I. Uriah never had to endure the reaping and the mourning and the grieving and the agony that those who wronged him did. Now, this is a big deal. There's something that Uriah never had to live with that David and Bathsheba had to live with. David's grief. I'm going to tell you something. Uriah never had to lay on the ground seven days while a baby's dying over here and then bury that baby and experience the grief. Uriah never had to have somebody come running up to him and say, Uriah, your son just raped your daughter. Uriah never had to have somebody come running up to him and say, Uriah, one of your sons just killed the other son. Uriah never had to have somebody come up and say, Uriah, one of your sons has an army and he's going to take over the throne. He's running you out of the country. He's out to kill you, your own son. I want to tell you something. David lived nonstop grief. Uriah didn't. You see, the things that we think that we're being cut off from and not this, that, and we didn't get to that, and this was done to this, and this was done to this, sometimes it's a blessing and we don't know it. I've seen people, I've stood, I'm telling you something, I've, I've sat in the room with people who absolutely were wailing, who were weeping, who wanted to absolutely kill themselves over all the stuff that was going on in their life, you know, that had happened and so forth. And they thought during the process that they were going to be living life up, but they found out later it brought so much grief they wished they were dead. I wish I was dead. So I'm saying to you that Uriah left a testimony concerning grief that you let God do what he wants to do. It may be saving you a world, a world of grief. Um, then there's, then there's Bathsheba. Well, let's just, how do you think Bathsheba felt that night when she got back to her house? That night that David had her brought over there. When they took her back, how do you think she slept? Do you think she slept real good that night? How do you think she felt that, that day she woke up and realized that she was expecting a child? You think she had, oh, she, you think she got up next morning making bread and whistling, Jesus loves me, this I know, and oh, how I love Jesus? I'm going to tell you about that. You're talking about grief. God will teach something about grief right here. Be glad, be glad that you're not on the other. It's better to be on the side of being done dirty than to be on the side of those who are doing the dirt. Because those on the side of doing the dirt are going through things you don't never want to go there. I promise you that. And Bathsheba never had a peaceful night. I doubt the rest of her life. Anyway. Could it be better to die like Uriah than to live like David? Might be. It just might be. What about old Joab who was involved in the whole scheme? Finally chased it there to put, throw his hands on the horns of the altar. Slain right there. Nothing but a conniving deal. So we see that Uriah leaves us a testimony of grace. He leaves us a testimony of, of grief, but he leaves us a testimony about God. And this is the hard part. God is sovereign. I'd like to go, just to be honest with you. This week, reading this, meditating on it, saying, I'm like, Lord, could you and I just sit down and visit a while? Lord, why did you bring Uriah into this world for? When he was a little boy, five years old, running around, little Hittite boy, and maybe he was, you know, maybe he, you know, him or his forefathers, they converted to Christ and they followed you, Lord. And you knew all along that Uriah's going to go marry this beautiful woman, the girl of his dreams, and he's going to go off to war and she's going to be unfaithful to him and she's going to have a child by another man and this man's going to have him killed and it's going to be some of the closest people to him in his life. This man is going to be absolutely done dirty like a dog. Now, if you've never been dirty, done dirty like a dog, and life's been really sweet to you, and nothing's ever happened to you, this message is probably not worth a dime to you. But I want to tell you something. I, I like, I, sometimes I want to say, well, God, why did you have Uriah born, and why did all this stuff happen? I mean, is, is this just a little game, God, that you play? Oh, so you're going to create a Uriah who comes along, and he's just going to be a side note in history, and, and he's going to have his wife stolen. He's going to be murdered. And he's, you're, yeah, it's like smoke blowing off on the wind. That's it. I don't know about you, but that kind of stuff bothers me. 
I have to believe there's a sovereign God. And I want to tell you about it. He teaches us. He sends us a testament of the sovereignty of God. The truth about it is this morning, folks, that God is God. And he can do what he wants to, when he wants to, to who he wants to, how he wants to. And you and I do not have the right to ask him and challenge him about it. And that's just an honest fact. And the day we get back to the God of the Bible and quit saying that God's got to be a God that fits my mind and he's got to answer all my questions and he's got to explain everything to me, why he's doing this and why he allowed that and why this happened and why that happened. And God, if you don't, I'm going to quit you. I'm going to bail out on you, God, if you don't make me understand everything. Life has treated me dirty. Life has treated me wrong. And God, you better start talking. And God, if you don't start talking, you won't see me around. And we try to twist God's arm and making us understand why bad things happen to good people. God is sovereign. God has the right to do in and through our lives according to his divine will and purpose. And he doesn't have to even explain it to me. Can I tell you the wild thing about this is? To my knowledge, Uriah died, never knew that his wife was unfaithful, never knew that King David was a treacherous traitor to him and betrayed him, never knew that Joab was an absolute serpent and sent him to his death. Died, never even knew it. So, is Romans 8.28 still true? We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and the called according to his purpose. Is it still true? What about when you've been done dirty? What about when you feel like you're just some cast off to the trash pile of life and you try to be faithful to God and you were faithful to God? And I mean, and here's these people living like hell itself, David, Bathsheba, and Joab, and they're all still living. And they're all going on and life goes on. And you've just been thrown off and you were faithful. I don't know. I want to ask you a question. Listen to this. Was Job just kidding? Was he just talking spiritual when he said, Yea, though he slay me, yet will I serve him? Can you and I honestly say, Yea, though I none of my dreams ever come true, yet will I serve him? Yea, though my friends do me dirty, yet will I serve him? Yea, though I'm forsaken and betrayed and rejected by and, and I don't get the job and, and I lose my home or I'd lose this and my health goes bad and, and I'd never get married. Yea! I'll still serve him. This is amen, hallelujah time preaching, ain't it? I don't, I'm not preaching this down on anybody. I'm not preaching this hard, to be hard. I am preaching a really living truth that we just really need to get a hold of. This man, you rise, got way more in him than we realize. And uh, so anyway, was uh, was God unjust by lying Cain to kill Abel? I mean, best I can tell, Abel never never got married, never had a family, best I can tell. He's just cut off in his youth, and he's the one that was being faithful to God. Was God on vacation or asleep when Joseph was sold down into Egypt? When he was in slavery for 13 years, was God just kind of on vacation, just didn't quite see it, or he would have stopped it? No. What about when Naboth, a righteous man, the king says, I want to buy you a vineyard, can't sell it. God said, can't sell it. Jezebel comes up, has a monkey court, brings up false accusations. He's cursed God and, and, and the king. They stone him to death. Then they go out and get his boys and kill his boys so they can't be the heirs to the land, clear the, clear the deed out. What did Naboth do? As far as we know, it's a very righteous man. You listen to me. In this world, if you're going to be a faithful person, I'm talking about if you're going to be faithful, there are things going to happen to you you can't explain. If you're not careful, you're going to say, God, why? God, why? What's going to matter in the end? And this is, I'm, I'm flopping through this message. I promise you, I'm, I'm struggling. Okay, I'm, I'm just honest about it. Not trying to be pious. Not looking for. Uh, I'm not looking for this, that, or the other. Just being. Honest, I'm struggling with this message, but I know it's good because I'm struggling. This, this is what God told me through this message, Reggie. In the end, the only thing that's going to matter is not what you've had to endure, not what went wrong, not how dirty you've been done, or anything else. The only thing, Reggie, that's going to matter in the end is to hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And if I don't learn anything else out of your eyes life, I hope I can learn that. Because we have a tendency to get focused on what's went wrong. God, why would you let this happen? I stand behind this pulpit every Sunday morning, and I look in the eyes of people while I'm preaching to people whose spouse left them, or their spouse died, or their spouse was killed, or... They worked hard. They lost things. Things didn't turn out right. And they've been faithful. They've tried to serve the Lord. They're not perfect, you know, but they love the Lord. They, you know, they want to do the best. And I said, God, do I have an answer for the real questions going on in their life? God, give me a message. Give me something for your word that really answers the hard questions. Now, I realize that God's not going to answer every question, but there is something answered in this. And this is what matters. 
It's not what's happened to us. It's not how dirty we've been done. It's not what we've had to endure. It's not the problems of life. It's whether we're faithful. The In the end, that's all that's really going to amount to anything. Now, watch this. I read this in, in the deal this morning, that opening. Hebrews 16. Listen to it very carefully. This shoots straight back to Uriah, and it's in Hebrews 16. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Sister Pam, I want you to listen to this verse. Brother Dennis, I want you to listen to this verse. Your God, it says, is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Now, I pointed to that couple right there, but I could point and point and point and point and point, and I don't have time to do all that. There's something I want you to remember, that the God you serve is not forgetful, and he is not forgetting. He said, I'm not going to be unrighteous and, and forget what you've done in my name. Mona, you listen to me. God is not unrighteous. He will remember, and he will reward. And he said, Uriah, it may look like that I let your life be just all kinds of junk happen, and it wasn't like you dreamed it would be. And yes, you were killed young. And yes, you didn't get the, your, your, all the, the sweetest things you knew of and is, is turned into rot around you. Yeah, I haven't forgot your faithfulness. And I'll show you. Here it is. In 1 Kings 15, 5, when God writes the postscript for David's life, he says this. He talks about David was, talks about what a great man David was. And this is what it says. Save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, when he writes the postscript for David's life, he says, save only, he says, Great man, save only in the life and in, in, in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, here's the deal. Watch this carefully. God could have said, David did right except in one case and never even mentioned Uriah. He could have written in the matter of Bathsheba, but he didn't. Why? God remembers. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this book. This heaven and earth passed away and this book will never pass away. God put Uriah's name in there as a testimony that I don't forget faithful people. I want to tell you, church, something this morning. From that back wall to the front of this church, from that wall to that wall, I love you people. And I want you to know something about the God you came to church to worship this morning. He's looking for faithfulness, and he'll never forget it. And you and I know that we're not very faithful. But I want to tell you something. God doesn't forget faithfulness. It's required as stewards that a man be found faithful. God's not going to, the issue is not going to be how good of sermons I preach, Brother Bill. It's going to be with a faithful. The issue is not, this, that, and the other was a faithful brother shoemaker. No, God put in the Bible in the matter of Uriah. God was saying, I'm not forgetting the ministry and the faithfulness of Uriah. Watch this. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 6 in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, God records this, quote, David the king begat Solomon of Bathsheba. Not what it says. It doesn't even mention her name. It says her that had been the wife of Uriah. What's God doing? God is saying, I haven't forgot, Uriah. I haven't been unrighteous, Uriah. I haven't forgot how faithful you were when they all done you dirty. When every close person around you deceived you and lied to you and misused you and abused you and done you dirty as dirty can be. Uriah, I still remember your faithfulness. And church, I want you to remember this, that your Father in heaven remembers your faithfulness. And he has not forgot. And he will not forget. Be faithful. No, God brought Uriah full front into the eternal record. And for all of eternity, Uriah is going to be remembered because God put him right on through the Bible. God has fixed it so that the godliness, the faithfulness, the service, the righteousness of Uriah will never be forgotten in eternity. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions, and we're not far from being done, I promise you. How many believe Uriah went to heaven? Would most people agree Uriah went to heaven? Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. How many believe David went to heaven? So let's all, can we pretty well agree that Uriah and David is in heaven? Have you ever thought about their first meeting? I wonder how that went. Brother Bradley, I, I wondered this week, how'd that go? Uriah's been up there 40, 50 years. Here comes David. Now, I'm going to take for, I'm just going to assume that when Uriah died, that possibly, you know, he saw what he saw what the situation was. Now watch this. This would be a good think on it. Uriah dies faithful, doesn't even know, as far as we know, doesn't know about all this garbage going on around him, how dirty he's been done, how useless, how worthlessly they throwed his life away. He dies and goes to heaven. 
and he turns around and he sees the whole deal. All of a sudden he's in heaven and I don't know this, but just kind of, you know, I kind of think this might, I'd hate to think I was dumber in heaven than I am now. <laughs> that would be dumb. <laughs> uh, Uriah, your wife, you didn't get to say goodbye to her. She's uh, expecting a child with another man. Well, she is. You mean my wife wasn't faithful to me while I was gone? God, how could this happen? You're right. It's worse than that. You remember when David called you off the field? Yes, Lord, I came. Well, you're right. He was trying to cover it all up. He was lying to you. All that food he put out there and that wine and all that talk about going down to see a wife, that was all to cover up him and her sin. That was your king of whom you were one of his 37 mighty men. Lord, surely this can't be so. Oh, you're right. It's worse than that. You know, Joab, your commander, that man you served and dutifully obeyed, you remember Uriah when he told you to go up there to the hottest part of the battle? And you remember you, the thought that was in your mind just before you were killed? You looked around and they were all, the men had all left you and left you alone there? That was all set up. Uriah, you remember the letter you carried back to the army? Yes, Lord. That was King David sentenced you to death and Joab carried it out. But Lord, these were some of the closest people to my life. That was my wife. My beautiful wife of my dream. That was my king. That was my commander. I wonder what Uriah said. Is there any bitterness in heaven? I'd hate to think there was. I can't imagine. It can't be heaven with bitterness in it, can it? Honestly, I'm going to ask you a question this morning. When David and Uriah met, who would you rather be? When they met in heaven, I'll get this, who would you have rather been? When they met in heaven, would you have rather been David or whether you have rather been Uriah? I've been thinking on it. I hope that I do not deceive my own heart when I say I'd rather be Uriah. I would have hated to have been David and have to approach Uriah. I'm the man that stole your wife. I'm the man that ordered you killed. I was the man you trusted. I ask you this morning, who do you want to be, David or Uriah? You want to be faithful, get done dirty, life not go so good, a lot of dreams not fulfilled? Or do you want to be David, live to an old age with a life full of grief? Good question to ask ourselves. Whose shoes would you rather be standing in when you met each other in heaven? Here's Uriah's testimony. Oh, the grace of God that I'm even saved. I had the sentence of death on me, an old Hittite headed for hell. But I met God. Oh, the grief. Here's his testimony. Oh, the grief that I was spared by the sovereign hand of God. And here's his testimony. Oh, the God of glory who has the right to be God, who doesn't have to ask me about anything and doesn't have to report to me and explain everything to me. The God that created me for his glory. But the God who will never forget me. The God who will never leave me. The God who will never forsake me. And the God that will never be unrighteous to forget my labor of love and who will honor for all of eternity my faithfulness to him. This is Uriah's story. This is the true answer for dealing with the dirt that we get dished out to us in life. Be faithful. Be willing to be called a fool, but live under the facts. Let's stand. With our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, would there be a soul in this building today that you have struggled about these issues? You wanted to be faithful, but life has been dirty. It's dished out a lot of junk to you. I just want to have a little time here of inviting you to the altar today, maybe just to say, Lord, Lord God, help me to be like Uriah. I never wanted to be like Uriah before, but Lord, this morning I do. I just want to be faithful, even if I don't even know everything going on about my life. I'm just going to trust your grace. I'm going to trust you as God. Anybody here today, just slip out of your pew where you're at. Maybe several, maybe just one. I don't know, but you'd just come today and say, Lord, I'd rather be Uriah than David. God, help me to just be faithful, to focus on being faithful to you and not focus on all the dirt that's been done to me in my life. Would you come right now? Amen. God bless you. Somebody else today. Not trying to twist or nothing like that or say we've had an altar service. I, that's great and everything, but I, I just feel like I need to give you an opportunity to do business with God.
a sacred time with the Lord. Maybe as a result of this message, you'll go out somewhere on the backside of the farm and just sit down with the Lord and say, Dear God, I'm like Uriah. You may or may not know what's going on. You may or may not know about the dirt that's been done. You may or may not understand it. But, oh, God, I don't want it to blow me out of the water. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful like Uriah. And I want to hear when it's all done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God, help that to be so in our lives. I pray that the Lord will bless this message from his word to your life. And I pray that it will be a little part of the fabric of your soul. That there's a man named Uriah. Who often the world and even preachers cast aside as just a little side note. But he's not. He is one of the great, great men of faith in the Bible. God help us to imitate his faith. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for your truth. And I pray, God, today that we'll not just hear, but we'll do. And we'll lay these things to our heart so that whenever, Lord, life has dished us out the dirt, we will not focus on that, but we will focus on being faithful to you and focus on the desire to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless these homes and these families. God, help us to be faithful to you, to each other, to our spouses, to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Lord, help us to be faithful to our nation in the sense, Lord, of what it was founded to be. And Lord, just help us to be faithful to your word. And Lord, I just want to say I love you for loving me. When I've been so sorry, so wicked, so low down, I'm so grateful, Lord, that your mercy is new every morning. And what I do, Lord, if your mercy wasn't new every morning, oh, Lord, please bless these folks. I pray these families, these individuals, these hearts. And I'll thank you for it, Lord. Bring us back tonight, God. And God, I pray you'll bless Brother Shoemaker as he preaches. Fill him with your spirit. Give him the message from heaven that we need. That you know that we need, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.